And so it's loosely been framed with the sense of, of on the margins of the university. Um, and you'll see I've tried to work the title in a number of ways, and I just want to touch on that because I think it will help sort of set the tone of how we talk about this today. Um, I've used the word reflections because we're not going to be presenting the sort of pitch that we would about our projects to um, consumers of those projects or to funders. Instead, we're going to be discussing some of the motivations behind it, some of the um, sort of um, nuances, some of the critiques or concerns, um, and of course the hopes too. So there might be more of an affective sense of what we're talking about as we go through um, these interventions. Um, I've also used the word social justice. And in many ways, that's an emptied out term. Um, but yet it does encompass um, a larger drive to address and play an active role in remedying society's injustices. So it is that sense of, of social justice as a real attempt to, to address and remedy it. Both those injustices that occurred in the past, sort of historical legacy ones, but those that persist with an idea of a more just future at some point. There's also the sense of um, social justice in terms of higher education as a social institution itself. Um, and I'd like to just highlight here that this is cognizant of the geopolitics that exist in institutions and how they play against each other in different parts of the world, which institutions are seen as having more power, which academics are more valuable to um, protect, foreground, save, position over others. Um, so with that comes, of course, the particularity of context around what we see as social justice and what is important for redress in that society or that social institution. And I think as each of us speak, we'll be talking about how context has affected that understanding to some extent. Um, then I've used the term in and of the academy and I sort of um, italicized it because of the sense of, of the academy being um, what is sort of the outward process of formation that the university involves. So the people that it shapes, the knowledges that it shapes. Um, so both in terms of social formation, who it constructs for society, and knowledge formation. That's of course where the university is quite different to many other institutions. It's not just a social institution. It has a real role in legitimizing or delegitimizing knowledges um, in the world. But then also, um, in the academy, because what happens within the university, what, who it um, privileges within its own space, how it embodies ideas is very important for if it's actually going to land up practicing that. So I've tried to sort of suggest that all within the time, um, because I think different aspects of what we talk about touch on that. Um, so the critical concern, sorry, Oh, right. yeah. The critical concerns that we'll all touch on is about the aspects of limits to the university as we've known it. Um, because the university in many ways has been insufficient. Um, and also the possibilities for the future of the university. So there are, there's often a refrain of why even continue with the university, because why not throw them out if they're repeatedly being problematic. But the university is an incredible, powerful mechanism for change in society or reproduction in society. And if it's not addressed, um, yeah, there's real cause for concern. So that critical concern is really important. It's not, it's not naive. But there's an awareness of both the limits and the possibilities of the university within that. To just very, very briefly talk about um, higher education studies as a field of scholarship um, within this context so we can position critical higher education studies slightly differently. Sorry that this is such a really ghastly looking um, version of this image. It comes from a paper by um, Bruce McFarlane and it's often used to show the sort of mapping of higher education studies. It's very, very um, centred around UK, Australia, New Zealand and the standards of the field. I don't even think it properly matches what's happening in the States. 
Um, but what's useful about it is it shows um, some of the silos that exist in areas of foci in higher education studies. And, and that's a real problem um, because the convergence is how things are, can actually be addressed. It, um, it's an area of inquiry quite interestingly. I don't think, I don't think anybody in this room was here last year when June <coughs> Obi came from Japan and spoke about the growth of higher education studies there. And it literally happened in the early 1970s as an um, institute to survey student protests. <laughs> and it's interesting how this field has grown in and alongside the massification of higher education um, and for various different purposes. So, it's, so it, has a, it has a funny history in places that is often not uncovered. What has happened is that many of us are worried that it is increasingly insufficient. It's become a domesticated area of study that um, often serves the interest of providing information to those who come from quite dominant positions of power to ask for ideas. Sometimes it's continuous tropes and narratives um, which are in the interest of stasis and not of change. Um, it's been accused of being an atheoretical area of study by scholars from within it. Um, and that it is also um, a field that is precarious in itself. Many within it find, find it difficult to find positions. Many battle to um, assert that it shouldn't just be about practice, that study in higher education is, is of value, even to institutions of research. It's a sort of very funny irony. But you, you literally, if you map the careers of people <coughs> in the area of higher education studies and the centers, they're, they're constantly under um, precarious um, status. <coughs> um, one of the largest critiques, though, is that um, the field doesn't question the fundamental assumptions of education, that education is good. It doesn't question that idea. Um, it also, for the most part, doesn't question um, the, the sort of myth of slow incremental process of enlightenment. There's, a, there's a, often a buy-in that that's okay, it can, take, it can take as long as it needs to. Many of us who come from contexts where there's a real urgency to address change um, simply do not buy into that understanding of education. Um, so, particularly, we're talking about the margins of this issue because critical higher education studies begins then to from, from my understanding, some of the value of it, and later Jenny will give a sort of synopsis of critical university states, so I'm just wanting to sort of um, signal the, the broader area, is there's a, a prioritization of what happens on the margins. So instead of it being so much about top-down policy and what should be happening, or this is what an institution um, wants, it becomes about those who exist on the margins, those change coming up from the bottom. And it, the critical higher education studies then begins to take on far more interdisciplinary lenses because there isn't, there isn't an existing tradition that is sufficient enough and because of the complexity of the ecology of higher education. There's also a strong concern of those marginalised. Um, so it's actually a really nice space to be in because there are incredibly different orientations. Um, the, the big shift, I guess, would be around critical higher education studies is then the sense of questioning the fundamental assumptions of higher education. So on the one side, you'll have those who are perhaps the most extreme, um, particularly those informed by critical race theory in the States, who then say um, higher education has been formed to reproduce the inequalities of society and social stratification and requires extreme disruption right through to those who believe in working in smaller areas to affect change. And then underpinning all of that is a strong emphasis of notions of social justice. I'm separating this from critical university studies because critical university studies is a smaller area. And Jenny's been part of this team which has done this sort of synopsis of critical university studies which she'll present later, which is really interesting. So I'm trying to sort of foreground that we're talking in the larger space of critical higher education studies 
because critical university studies seems to exist in a, in a, in a smaller space within it. Um, it emerged in the US and in the UK for the most part as a rejection of neoliberalism. And I just want to foreground my own sort of um, trying to be openly ideological I sense in the way that I've tried to bring people together here today is that in the past two, two and a half years that I've, as I've experienced it here in the UK, and Tom and I are both part of the sort of farming group of the um, early career researchers or whatever of um, critical university studies in the UK, is that there's that very strong, strong sense of nostalgia for a past um, EU and university that perhaps never really existed and has been critiqued and changed and, and has had so many mutations since. But all of those are seen as, in a sense, a buying to, to liberal concerns. And my larger concern was really that it didn't question, it didn't center the question of the university's own formation and the way that it played out in other parts of the world. Especially the violent machinations of settler colonialism that universities were essentially a part of. Um, it also didn't seem to centre issues of exclusion within the UK too. So there's a whole lot of scholars working in race, um, gender issues, disability issues, all those protected characteristics in the UK, and it didn't seem to be centred within um, critical university studies, at least as I experienced it. Um, and so bringing these things at the margin to discussion here is really about trying to look at the issue of delegitimation of peoples, groups, knowledge, history, the play of Jewish politics, and then also the really huge lack of solidarity for those oppressed within our midst. And this is within the academic community within our midst, which is why Tom's work in Kara is particularly important. Um, and so there's a sort of persistent worry about higher education studies, critical university studies, and how it plays out in all of that. It's blinkered spots. Um, so the interventions that we're discussing today, I believe, may be of value not just for studying, but also <coughs> trying to actively shape this area. Um, so it's around, the, these terms are almost used quite a lot as we speak, disruption, transformation, social justice, but also this issue of what is the authority of academics who are in a position of privilege, also far more really importantly, a position of responsibility for authoring knowledge and creating university spaces. Um, so this is sort of the outline of the talks as we'll go, but we'll sort of see how everyone's feeling. Okay. Um, I'm not going to do too much of the big introductions of everyone because we've done them as we spoke today, if that's all right. Um, if we can keep it quite informal. Um, so, just to say, Tom's work with Syrian academics in exile, which I've had a tiny part, thank you, um, is, has, is really around, I'm going to frame this for you and then you can just disagree with me. Um, the space of academic development broadly defined, um, and the role that it can play for creating the conditions for academics to be both critical and creative agents when institutional authority is stripped from them, um, when institutional autonomy is eroded because of various issues such as international law, and what the issue of academic freedom is, um, outside of the protections that we are afforded.